So let's turn in our Bibles now to 1 Corinthians, almost said 2 Corinthians, we'd be lost. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 through 31. Congregation participation time. If you are already there, you can participate in this trivia question. Did you know that the United States of America has an official national motto? And if so, what is it? I heard it from the second row. But if you don't know, <laughs> oh boy, that was dangerous for me to open up. If you don't know, pull out a dollar bill or a $10 bill. I have here a sharp, crisp $5 bill. And on the back of the bill, you're going to find the official national motto, which says, and Rachel got it right, in God we trust. On your money, it says, in God, we trust. Think about it. Every time you hand your money and you transact, you are communicating, in God, we trust. This is the official national model. This was actually voted in by an act of Congress in 1956. Can you imagine our Congress today voting in a national motto that says, in God, we trust? Hard to imagine. It's all over our money. But you might not know that there was an official motto of the nation before that. And it too is imprinted on our money. It is a Latin phrase that actually may have derived from a Greek philosopher named Heraclitus who lived in the city of Ephesus who wrote this phrase, ek ponton en kai ex enos ponta, which means the one is made up of all things, and all things issue from the one. And this Greek phrase gets rendered down in Latin as e pluribus unum. So if you have one of these uh, not so shiny brown coins, you're like, what is that? I've never seen that before. This is actually a penny. <laughs> it's worthless. E pluribus unum is stamped on the back of this penny. Out of one, many. Our founding fathers understood that they were doing something powerful when they ratified the forming of this country. It was a powerful proclamation of unity for the, for the colonies, the 13 colonies, to come together as these united states. And so E Pluribus Unum struck the right tone at the founding of our nation, and it was put on all of our coins and all of our bills, it's actually as a watermark on the $5 bill, so that every time you hand that $10 bill for lunch, in God we trust, and you get back those meaningless pennies, and you, you, you're tempted to grumble and think, why are these still in circulation? I want you to just pause and remember. Look at it and remember, e pluribus unum, out of one, many. And the flip side is true also, out of many, one. And then you could take your penny, you can throw it like in your change drawer and never look at it again. As powerful as this motto was for our fledgling country, our unity in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is unparalleled. E pluribus unum is not just a motto for these United States. It is an apt description for the church on mission where God saves sinners from his wrath that is to come from all over the world, from every tribe, tongue, and nation, and he plucks us out of darkness and brings us into true, abundant, spiritual life in Christ and makes us one together in Jesus. This is the beauty and the glory of what God's doing in the gospel. He's making us one in Christ as the church. And it is oh so easy to forget our oneness. Out of one, many. Out of many, one. Especially for us modern American Christians who are so used to celebrating our independence that we are often in danger of ne neglecting the design of interdependence that God has made in the church. Amen. He gives different gifts, we saw last week, to different people so that we join together and we use our gifts to help each other treasure Christ, the infinite worth of Christ, 
that we would see Jesus as lifted high. That's what God's doing in the church when hammer mills are putting out pellets, which is creating jobs so that these kids can grow up and they can hear and live out the gospel. If we forget that that's what God's doing, if we lose sight of that purpose, that oneness that we have in Jesus, then we will fail to treasure Christ as he deserves. And the, the sad, sad implication of that is that our joy in God diminishes when we don't treasure Christ as we ought. And then our faith, our functional faith is as worthless as a penny in the year 2019. And Paul says to the church in Corinthians, there's a better way. There's a different way. There's a gospel that unifies. We need each other. Out of one, many, out of many, one. We're going to see that this precedes the national motto. This is actually biblical. So please read with me in verse 12 through the end of the chapter. As Paul continues to write to this church. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body. That would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, what would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. Verse 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greatest honor, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating in various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts. And I will show you a still more excellent way. Father, we thank you that this word is before us and we want to be shaped by it because we, we want to honor you, Lord. We want to follow you. You have plucked us out. You have brought us near. You have made us one and one with a purpose. So God, place that purpose on our hearts this morning. Give every person here, member of Grace Church, guest, young or old, a vision of the purpose you have for life in the church so we could play the part that you've called us to play and that we could glorify Jesus in what we do. Lord, I pray you would inspire us this morning to do our parts, empowered by the the Holy Spirit of Christ. In his name we pray, amen. I've got two points this morning. They are simple. First, God made us together as one. This is a theological basis for everything else that's going to be said. God made us together as one. This is not my idea. This is not the idea of man. This is God's doing. God made us together as one, verses 12 through 13. You see that our text begins with a comparison Paul uses the illustration of the human body to say something about the church. And, and, and he's, he's relying on your intimate knowledge with the human body. 
It's like, you know how the body works. That's how the church works too. Your body has many members, and yet there is a main identity of you. You have arms, you have legs, and yet there's you, there's one. That's why he says in verse 12, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. When you walk into the doors and someone greets you, they say, how are you doing? They don't address all the different parts of your body. How are you? How is the left hand doing? How is the right foot doing? No, they say, how are you, this collection of members that is one? This is not the first time that we've seen Paul use the metaphor of the body. You don't have to flip there. You can if you want. Um, but they should be on the screen, I believe, above me. In 1 Corinthians 6, 15 through 17, he says, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? That our bodies are members of Christ is known since whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Then he said in chapter 10, verse 17, as he talks about the Lord's Supper, he says, because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. He says that the bread that we break, it's a participation, verse 16, in the body of Christ. This is the picture of the church. We are, we are many members, very different backgrounds and ethnicities and family histories, but when we come together in faith in Christ, we are all joined into the same body. Paul says in verse 13, Jews and Greeks, slaves and free. And, and we hear that and we might not even think, what, what is that? Like that's just like a slogan. That's a reality in the New Testament church. The Jews and the Gentiles who were far apart in terms of culture and law coming together in Christ. Those that are slaves, those that are free, coming together to the same place of worship. It's not just a slogan. It was, it was reality. Paul says Jews, Gentiles, slaves, free, all are baptized into one body. We see that in verse 13. Baptized into one body. We just saw a baptism last week. As Keaton Roberge went down in the water and came out of the water. This, this idea that all of us members are, are baptized into Christ. It's a metaphor for how God makes us reborn when we turn to him in faith. It's, a, it's an echo of what he said about Moses in the wilderness in chapter 10 when he said the Israelites were all baptized into Moses. It's this idea that you're like following him, in him, and drank the same spiritual drink. When we come to know Christ by the Spirit, we are one, baptized, drinking, sharing the same Spirit. And this is for anyone who comes, Jew, Gentile, slave, free, nothing stops the power of the gospel. No one is prevented from getting in on this good news. This is not a gospel for the Jews only. It's not a gospel for the Gentiles only. It's not a gospel for the rich men only. It's not a gospel for just the slaves. It's not a gospel for, for the educated or for the lowly or for men or for women women only. It's for all people from every tribe, tongue, and nation to create this wildly diverse, unique, new body. This new group of human beings no longer identified primarily as Jew, Gentile, slave, free, men, male, female, but now identified as one in Christ. A new body, a new culture, a new nation, a new people, a new society. This is, this is massive what God is doing when he's started the church. So we ought not to treat the church like it's a worthless penny. We need to see the church for what it really is, e pluribus unum on steroids. God has joined us together as one, out of many, one. This is the foundation of the church. It is the anchor, our shared participation in the gospel by the Spirit. And Paul begins here. Because if we don't get this right, if we don't get this theological truth right, and we keep talking about gifts, and we don't get that we're one centrally, if we don't get this right, then, then we're going to drift away from our eyes focused on Christ, and we're not going to see Christ for who he is, and we're not going to see the bride of Christ, the church, as she is. And if we take our eyes off of Christ and our unity that's meant to be in him, we will develop a very bad syndrome known as DFI syndrome. 
don't fit in syndrome. Trust me when I tell you this, after 18 years or so of pastoring, this is a real syndrome. As people come into the church excited about the love of Christ, excited about their eyes lifted up to the cross, excited to join arms with brothers and sisters from all different backgrounds, to look to Jesus, and as you focus on Christ, experience tremendous blessing, and as your eyes move away from that and you look just horizontally at one another, you think, oh, I don't actually think I fit in here. I'm not tall like that guy, and I'm not funny like that guy. And I don't do the things that that person does, and the church doesn't do that, and the church doesn't do this, and you start to feel the differences. And it, you, start to, you start to feel like, I don't fit in here. And my appeal on the basis of this teaching is to charge us to remember that we are never meant to be joined together, ever, as one by anything other than the gospel. We're not meant to come together and find a bunch of people just like us so that we can say, oh, you look just like me. You like the things that I like. You want to do the things that I want to do. Well, great. We're one. We're never meant to do that. We're meant to gather around Christ with diverse people who come from all different backgrounds. So when you walk into this place, you can't just think, oh, Sunday service or, oh, Great Hearts Gym. No, you need to think about the body of Christ coming together as one with all of our gifts, all of our ambitions, all of our wildly diverse uh, manifestations of the Spirit to look upwards together to treasure Christ. It is not a rich man's gospel, a freed man's gospel, a male-only gospel, a charter school gospel, a white gospel, or a middle-class gospel. It is a gospel for all kinds of people who submit themselves to the lordship of Christ. And everyone who does, out of many, one. And out of one, many. So he goes on to say this unity in Christ, this togetherness, is expressed in the diversity of our gifts. 14 through the end of the chapter is that point two, God made us to complement one another. God made us to complement one another. Now, I don't mean complement in the sense of verbal affirmation, like, oh, don't you look nice today? Now, that's fine, and you probably ought to do some of that too um, if we're friends. But that's not what I mean by compliment here. I mean by compliment that we're to, we're to see our gifts and our service and our ministries fitting together to match. Like, like I listen to Jerry Self talk and I think, I can't do anything that that guy does. I can't. And, and then I think, praise God that Jerry Self is in our body. Because I can't do any of the things he does. But he's doing the things he does. Growing up, we used, to, we used to do jigsaw puzzles. How many of you have ever done a jigsaw puzzle? All right. We would spend hours trying to find the right piece to match up the board, and I would be that kid who would find one that was pretty close and be like, I'm going to make this piece work. Can I, like, fit it in and, like, jam it in? And then it's not a perfect fit, so you throw it away, and then you're like, okay, I think this one might be it. I know that that little, that little edge is a little bit longer than it needs to be. So maybe I could take some scissors and, like, cut it down, you know, and, like, fit it in. And, and, and I would keep trying and trying, and finally we find the one piece that snaps into place. It's the complement piece to the board. And you know that, that weird sense of, like, satisfaction when you've been searching for an hour for a little piece and you finally find it and you snap it into place? It's like joy erupts from your heart when it's in place. Well, that's the picture of how the body is meant to function. Just as every piece is meant to fit in the right spot on the board, so each individual, each member who has been grace-gifted by the Spirit for the building up of the church, has a part to play in the church. We're not all meant to do the same things. We're meant to complement each other with the gifts God has given us. Look, look at verse 14. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. Now, throughout this section, you're just going to kind of hear the same things being said over and over again. When you see repetition in the Bible, it's a cue for you to just sort of get it. You know, like, okay, all right, I got it more. Okay, yes, I got it. It's just going to reinforce the same idea out of many, one. 
But on the flip side, jigsaw puzzles don't come together easily. So it's, we're meant to snap together, but there are challenges to doing this. And he's raising some objections that, that the Corinthians may have had, maybe you have, about how the body is supposed to work. So one of them that he raises in verse 15 and 16 is, some might think that their gifts don't count. Like, you know, you're, you don't make the cut to keep playing. They don't count. So he personifies two different members who are struggling with their place in the body to make his point. He makes the foot and the ear speak. And here's what they say, verse 15. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, that would make it not any less a part of the body. So he's talking to a particular person in the, in the church who thinks, because I don't have the same gifts as Jerry self, I must, I must not belong. Like this self-pity self-depreciating kind of attitudes. Sometimes people talk this way when it comes to, to speaking gifts. Like as if preaching is the only gift in the body that matters. So I look, you look at the preacher and you go, I, I can't preach like that, so I must not have any role. I don't have a place. And he says, that's wrong. Just because you feel self-pity doesn't mean it's changed anything. All members share equal status as members, whatever your gifts. Equal status as members. The small, the small, so think of it this way. The small puzzle pieces matter just as much to the finished product as the large puzzle pieces. And if we believe that God's the one who distributes these gifts, verse 11, we're going to see that again through, like multiple times today. If he's the one who distributes these gifts and places them in the body and constructs it just the way he wants according to his will, then God wants your gifts in the body, whatever they are. He wants your gifts in the body. More importantly, he wants you in the body using your gifts. So in other words, he made the puzzle. Like, he took the jig and cut all the shapes, and he distributed them. So if you have a piece of the puzzle, you belong. You are valuable. So now, some might think that their gifts aren't needed. So, okay, like, fine. Maybe you think, I can't sing like Tara, but I guess I'm still a member because I've got a puzzle piece. But that doesn't mean that my gifts are valuable. And then, no, Paul says, that's not true. He gives this funny picture in verse 17 through 20. He says, look at verse 17. So by like teasing this out, if the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? Now just slow down enough to think about this, right? This, like, I, I read this verse and I think of uh, like the main character of Monsters, Inc., you know, with the big eye, you know. <laughs> it's Billy Crystal's voice, right? What's his last name? Like Wazowski or whatever his name is. I think about that guy. This one eye. Just his whole body is basically an eye. If the whole body was just an eye, how crazy would that be? Where would the sense of hearing be? <laughs> you could see great, but you can't hear anyone say, wow, you look kind of strange. If the whole body were an ear, so now picture just ears everywhere. I think of this like as a Twilight Zone episode or something. Where would the sense of smell be? And you start to get his point, right? It's, it's not putting down any gifts. Seeing is great, but so is hearing. Hearing is great, but so is the ability to smell. You could go on. Writing is great, but so is walking. Running is great, but so is sitting. Every part has its purpose. All of the gifts have their place and purpose in building up the body. So this hypothetical picture, now in verse 18, he says, but as it is in reality, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? Praise God that that's not the case. As it is, there are many parts yet one body. Paul continues to emphasize the sovereignty of God in the distribution of the gifts. His sovereignty in the placement of the body parts. God's designed the body. So if you, if you like disparage your own place in the body or anyone else's place in the body, you're actually insulting God's wisdom. 
because it's his design. And, and, and praise God, brothers and sisters, we don't need 150 eyes. We don't need 150 ears. We don't need 150 eyebrows. We need the body to be the body that God has made. Now, some might think that their gifts aren't valuable, but some might think that others' gifts aren't valuable. So like the previous verses are about those who, who are thinking about themselves negatively, but now it shifts, and, and, and so now there's this like, this is question about whether or not other people's gifts are valuable. So the eye cannot say to the hand in verse 21, I have no need of you. As if to say, unless you can see like me, then you really kind of are pointless. You're like a penny. That's not true, he says. Read verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, you see God's sovereignty again, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. And if one member is honored, all rejoice together. We can't point to the gifts that seem weaker or less honorable and say, you aren't helpful. You aren't beneficial. So they were caught up in tongue speaking and prophetic utterances and all kinds of supernatural demonstrations of the power of the Spirit. And they might look upon somebody who had the gift of faith or the gift of helps, or the, or the ability to administrate and think, that is so not flashy. That's that, you're nobody unless you have these kinds of gifts. If you're not the engine of the car, then you're basically like worthless. And that's not at all what's true. Brian Rosner uses this car illustration. He says, one could imagine a comparison between a car's oil drain plug and its electronic ignition system. One is as low-tech and unimpressive as it could be, while the other is highly sophisticated. And here's his point. But a car won't last long without its oil drain plug, no matter how impressive its ignition system. The various hoses used to deliver fuel or other fluids from one part of the car to the places where they're needed are not impressive or technological wonders, but it would be ridiculous to think that the car could get along without them. The failure of one little valve can shut down the whole bodily system. The implication is that there is no unimportant gift or person in the body of Christ. I learned this lesson the hard way two years ago when I bought my Toyota Tundra and I didn't realize that the water pump was leaking and that defective little piece of plastic led to my entire engine blowing on the side of the 303 freeway and Kurt Wellendorf and Jeff Pratt, who are not here this morning, would have known all about that because they rescued me. He's saying, they all matter. They all count. In fact, he goes on to say, without getting too graphic, that the way we treat our bodies shows that we take care of all of our parts. So we intuitively know that some parts are more presentable than others. You might notice I'm not wearing any gloves this morning. I don't have my face covered. But I do have clothes on. He says some parts of the body give a lot of attention to making sure other parts of the body have modesty. That certain other parts don't require. And so we don't worry about it when, when we come into church and, and our, we don't have our faces covered or our hands covered. But if someone says to you, hey, your zipper's down. <laughs> your feet, the members of your body, the feet, turn you around <laughs> and then your hand quickly zips up because it demands immediate attention. And we intuitively know this, that the zipper and the chin need, need two different sources of attention at certain times. This is not to argue that every gift has the same value, but to esteem every gift as having value to make the body work, and therefore we should treat every member, every member with care. Honoring their gifts, whether flashy gifts or not, so that no one in the body gets left out, overlooked, dismissed, marginalized, or otherwise discarded. Okay, why, why does this matter? 
I think we're getting the point. I hope you're getting the point. If you're not getting the point, come talk to me afterwards. I'll tell you more. Why does this matter? The point is, remember from chapter 12, verse 7, all things for the common good, all of these manifestations for the common good. What matters is, is that as we use our gifts, as we use our gifts, Christ is exalted. The body is functioning correctly. We glorify him. And no one lacks care. He says, if one member suffers, all suffer together. Like, I'm getting old enough now to when I wake up in the morning, there's a different body part that hurts when I wake up. And I'm like, why is my back hurting this morning? I didn't do anything. Why does my foot just sort of throb? I have no idea. And it's not as if the rest of your body just sort of ignores it. Like, you limp all day long. When one member suffers, all the members suffer. We've experienced tragedy in our church over the last few months with the passing of Nick. And when, when that happens, we all suffer. We all lament. We all cry. We've experienced blessing and joy in the last few months. So Greg Hodson and John Moorhead were ordained as elders in this body. And as we saw Keaton be baptized, and as we see what God's doing, we rejoice together when one member is prospers, when one member uh, rejoices and is doing well, then the whole body does. Because out of one, many, and out of many, one. So this should drive us to say, where are we, where are you serving with the gifts that God has given you in the body of Christ? Where are you serving the body of Christ so that the members are built up into Jesus with joy? Where are you contributing? Maybe you don't know anything about tractors, but you do know things about building barns and sheep pens. You know, maybe you don't know anything about Greek, but maybe you know how to make a meal. Maybe you don't know anything about how to make a meal, but you know how to sit and walk someone through a really difficult issue in their life. Maybe your gift is to pray. Maybe your gift is to come alongside people and to pray for them. Where are you serving the body of Christ? And listen, let me just be clear. This is not something that must be sort of um, propelled by the pastors. I mean, by all means, we want to encourage you to do this. You have been gifted by God. You have been gifted by God with the Spirit to do your part. It should energize you. You should, you should have a, a sense of, of, of ambition to play the part that God's caused you to play. Whatever part that is. Where's God pressing you into serving? There's so many ways in this body, formally and informally, that you can serve. Whether it's physical gifts where you're serving and you're moving or you're, or you're setting up or you're tearing down or you're, you're helping to, to put a backyard in or whether you're coming alongside somebody with hospitality and bringing a meal or whether you're, you're uh, administratively minded and you're helping to get someone organized or whether you're bringing technical skills to bear or whether you're just helping people know how to lead better. Some of you are gifted to serve in, in practical ways. Some of you are gifted to speak to speak with, with words of wisdom and with knowledge. Some of you are gifted to teach and to preach. Some of you are gifted with prophecy and exhortation. Some of you may be gifted with tongues, the prayer of faith, the gift of faith. Some of you are, are gifted with healings, all these different manifestations of the Spirit you might have. Where are you using those if you have them? Do you even know where you're gifted. Do you know how to use your gifts? I think it's clear as he concludes this section that he, as he's restating his main point, he gives a string of, of, of roles and questions to drive home his point. Look in verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it, and God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. These verses have been the subject of much debate. Because not every gift is listed here. The first three gifts are actually people. And somewhat of a historical approach, apostles, prophets, 
teachers. You see that even in Ephesians. It's more of like a historical theological approach. And then he shifts to supernatural seeming gifts like miracles and gifts of healing. But then he says helping and administration and then tongues. Given that tongues were the, the main sought-after gift in this church, they were the hot topic in the church, it's probably intentional that he's putting them here last. But I think that he's showing, that this text shows that God is the one who gives all different kinds of gifts. People, speaking, serving, all different kinds of gifts. I don't think this list is supposed to make analytical sense to us other than to show that all these kinds of gifts come from God. Yes, all of them do. And to drive home the point that no one has all the gifts. There's no one who has all the gifts. There's no one who can say they're all contained in moi. He asked these questions. It's written in Greek in such a way that it anticipates a no response. There's no other way to, to take the Greek other than to say no to these questions. Are all apostles... No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Do all work miracles? No. Do all possess gifts of healing? No. Do all speak with tongues? No. Do all interpret? No. God has not given one person all the gifts. He made us to need each other because as we get from each other, we get God. And then he concludes here, but earnestly desire the higher gifts. The Greek here is actually ambiguous. You can look at the footnotes in your Bible. You'll probably see it there. Because the same word for earnestly here, which is an imperative, can also be translated as a second person plural. But you earnestly desire the higher gifts. And I will show you a still more excellent way. Either way it's translated, it still has the same idea. You think these gifts are the higher gifts are here, big, profound, supernatural kind of gifts. I'm going to show you a better way. And we're going to see that next Sunday, what that better way is. Where are you gifted? Where are you serving? As you look around this church and you see all the ways in which God is using the church, and you see all of the needs of the church, and you see all of the ministries of the church, one approach would be to look at it and be like, man, you guys are doing a lot. That just looks tiring. You know, another approach would be to say, yeah, by God's grace, he's allowing us to do a lot. And it's good to be exhausted in the service of the king. He's given us these gifts to use. Let us tire ourselves in serving Jesus Christ. Or let's Netflix binge. It's one of the two, right? <laughs> There's really almost no in between anymore. Let's use our gifts for something meaningful and long-lasting, eternal. Let's build each other up. Let's send each other out. Let's see God rescue people from the grips of hell. Man, I want to see that happen. Are you a member? And I don't mean, yes, a member of Grace Church. Are you a member of the body of Christ? Are you a Christian? Are you a member of a local church that you're joined together, whether it's here or somewhere else? Then ask yourself this question. How do I enjoy serving Christ? Because part of the way God's gifted us is to enjoy serving him. So how do you enjoy serving Christ? And then are you doing that in some capacity? Do you see a way forward into doing that? Is there a way you can break into that? Is there a ministry that can be created so that you can serve and give expression to those gifts? What are the needs of the church? Maybe God will give you gifts as you serve someplace. Look, I've shared this before, but, and she's in children's ministry this morning, but Ruth McFadden had never played a day of percussion in her life, I don't think, prior to just a couple years ago. And there was a need in the body for percussion. And she said, I want to play. Actually, that's not what she said. She said, I want to be helpful. And she said, I want to volunteer. Maybe I could play percussion. Now, I was like, Man, I've known Ruth a long time. I've never seen her strike a drum. And so I'm like, I don't know. Maybe, maybe you are gifted at that. I don't know. So we're at a Christmas party, and I have my djembe there, and Ruth's there. And so I was like, well, here you go. Let's see what you can do. And she starts banging on the drum, and I'm like, all right. And so we get together for like sort of like a practice. 
And I didn't tell her this, but I gave her the four songs that we were going to play at church that Sunday. And so I said, why don't you start with this? And we started playing through it. And it was like, good. It's like, Ruth is really good. And we played through all the songs. And I'm like, Ruth, I think you've got a gift to do this. Those are all the songs we're doing on Sunday. <laughs> You're in. <laughs> so panicky. And she wasn't playing this morning, but she's played regularly in the band for like the last year and a half or whatever it's been because she had a heart to serve and God gifted her to do it. Let me conclude by reminding you that all of our gifts come to us as grace gifts from the risen Savior. All of this is about Jesus, not exalting our own names, but exalting Jesus and building the body up as Christ intends so that God gets the glory from your gifts. Because God made us to need each other because from each other we get more of God. I am privileged to be a part of this body of Christ. I'm privileged to be a part of you. And I'm so glad that you have gifts that I don't have. I need your gifts. You need my gifts. We all need each other's gifts if we're going to be the body that God's made. Let's pray. Father, we, we come around this morning, around this word, and we are charged by it, Lord. I, I just want our church to thrive, Lord, in you. I want us to hunger for you. I want us to thirst for you. I want us to find joy in you. So much of how you made us to find joy is to use our gifts in serving. Would you help each person here who's a believer to, to know the way in which you've equipped them with these gifts to serve? And maybe there's various gifts, and maybe this season one gift gets highlighted over another. I pray that you would give us discernment in that. I pray you'd help us to not despise the gifts we have, nor look down on the other gifts in the body as if they're worthless, but to celebrate them, not worship them, not discard them or disparage them, but to celebrate them because you're making the body strong through them. And Lord, I pray for those in this room who don't know you and aren't joined to you. They're not one. And Lord, they face an eternity separated from you. God, I pray you would move in their hearts this morning to receive Christ and that they would get in on this, this action, <laughs> that you would grant your Holy Spirit to them. You'd grant to them forgiveness for their sins as they turn from their sins and they put their faith in you. Help them this morning to say, God, please help me follow after you. I repent. And Lord, would you do that work so that they would join this one out of many one. In Christ's name we pray, amen.